The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Well, good morning and welcome to Oxford United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you joined us for worship today. We gather to come and to sing unto our Lord, to shout for joy for the rock of our salvation. As we get into our worship this morning, we do have a few announcements for you. Number one, as always, make sure to fill out the yellow card that is in your bulletin this morning. You can deposit those in the baskets along with any tithes or offerings that you might have. I'll also draw your attention to the back of your bulletin. If you prefer to give to this church online, it is an easy, confidential, and convenient way to do so. There's a QR code there for you that directs you right to our online giving on the back of your bulletin. We also invite you, invite you this morning to join us in the Memorial Lounge right after the service for some fellowship that's just through these doors and straight down the hall. You'll end up in, in the Memorial Lounge and we will have a great time of fellowship and snacks and drink with one another. Also, in your bulletins this morning, there is an insert for Easter flowers. We order these every year regardless, but if you would like to dedicate uh, in honor of or in memory of someone, this is your opportunity to do so on there. Or if you just want to donate towards the purchase of these flowers, that is good as well. And then lastly, this is not in your bulletin or any church announcement anywhere. Some of you got texts from my wife that my daughter has Girl Scout cookies for you in my office if you ordered them. This is not an open invitation to go there. In fact, there's like the raspberry ones down there, which I hear are going like for $100 on eBay right now. So I'm not sure I should have announced that in church, but I think we're pretty safe <laughs> this morning. Well, that is all of our announcements this morning. Would you please rise in body or in spirit as Reed comes forward to lead us in our call to worship? Caleb, we may be able to fund some projects with those raspberry cookies. I don't know. Good morning. It's so lovely to see everyone here this morning. For God so loved the world, so that everyone who believes, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. God so loved the world. As you remain in your posture of worship this morning, would you join with me in our prayer of confession, which you can find in your bulletin this morning. Holy God, you are the judge we answer to, but too often we have judged our neighbors and condemned them before we know them, before we have even heard them speak. We have abused others by calling ourselves saved and others condemned. We have hurt others by trying to save them. We have forgotten, O oh God, that you have called us to judge ourselves, to seek forgiveness, 
to remove the log from our own eye. May we seek forgiveness where we have harmed others. And may we deepen our trust in you. In the name of Jesus, who calls on us to be born in a new way, we pray. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. That because of Jesus' great love for us, which was poured out on the cross for us, we have been justified through our faith and forgiven of our sins. Friends, this morning, receive that news in your heart. You are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our call to prayer, I invite you forward to light a candle on either side uh, for a hope or concern or a prayer request. But let's prepare our hearts in a moment of meditative silence as you come forward and light candles. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you on this brisk Sunday morning with our hearts and minds full of joy and full of concerns. We have hope, yet we feel mired in despair. We lift our voices, O Lord, for you to hear our prayers. Lord, we pray for Pastor Caleb, the staff, the leadership, and the volunteers here at OUMC. We ask that you give them the strength and courage to serve you to the best of their ability. Lord, we pray for this body of Christ and the house in which we sit. Protect us and keep us safe that we may continue your work. Lord, as spring break looms for our Miami students, we ask prayers of safety and traveling mercies. Let them go forth and enjoy their youth and experiences but we ask that you bring them home safely at the conclusion of their journey. Lord, we pray for peace and understanding, not just for our own households and communities, but for our nation. Allow us to find common ground through love and grace. We pray for peace in Eastern Europe, for the South Pacific, and as always, the Middle East. Lord, we lift to you and pray for those who are in need of comfort and healing, comfort from loss, comfort from pain, and comfort from insecurities of food, shelter, warmth, and love. Lord, we also pray for those who are in need of healing, be it physical, emotional, or what other capacity they need it, Lord. We know that in Christ, you will give us what we need to carry on in your service. We believe, Lord, help us with our unbelief as we continue to grapple with worldly ideas and issues that try and blind us to your grace and love. Let us remember the words that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. 
Praise be to God and Father our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Father, in the season of Lent, let us remember and renew our calling to sonship through Jesus Christ. Let us live a Christ-like life through the power of the resurrection, that we may allow the light of Christ to shine and give hope to all. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, and I'll be reading verses 32 through 45, and I'll be reading out of the NIV. They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the son of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptized, baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant in, with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord over, uh, lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus is drawing a line for us. The last couple of weeks he's been busy in his teachings drawing this line. Now this line, he's not literally drawing it. It is a figurative line. And this is not a line between people. This is not even a line between people and God. It's not a line in the sand. This is not a line that divides. But rather, it is a line of connection. And it is connected with the life that he offers all people. It's a simple line. But this line connects us as the church with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ. That through his teachings on his death and resurrection, he's not just preparing the disciples for what's going to happen soon, but rather he's trying to help them see that the death and resurrection of him is going to provide a new way of living for the people in the world. But here's the problem. This is what we prefer. We erase the line. For too long, the church has done this very thing. 
We want the privilege and convenience of believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus, but we don't want it to affect the way we live. We don't want it to affect our relationships or how we treat other people. And it's easy to see that when we disconnect our way of living with the death and resurrection of Jesus, we not only cut ourselves off from the life-giving force that he offers us, but we also are then able to do things that we want to do. Condemn others. Absolutely. Control others. Treat others poorly. Ignore others. We can do all those things because we've erased that line. We no longer see that Jesus invested his time teaching about his death and resurrection, not just to give us comfort, but to give us a way of life. And the reason why we like to disconnect the death and resurrection of Jesus from the way we live our lives as a church is that we think that life is this zero-sum game in which some people, if they have enough power, if they have enough resources, they can get a bigger slice of the pie for themselves. Not realizing that in doing that, they deny a whole other group the means that they need to live. And so instead of being a reflection of God's kingdom, we become a reflection of the kingdom of humans. We lust for the same power. We not only desire wealth, but we want to hoard that wealth keep it for ourselves. We will use whatever means we can to carve out an, a life divorced from the teachings and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last week we were taught through the second teaching of the death and resurrection of Jesus that he gave to his disciples. We were taught to practice resurrection mindfulness. In other words, to evaluate all aspects of our lives, all levels of society, through Jesus' death and resurrection. But we saw that the disciples, they were arguing with one another about who's the greatest. Who's the goat when it comes to the disciples? And Jesus says, no, you got it all wrong. Look at life through what I offer you. Look at life through my death and resurrection. Why is this so important? Well, Eugene Peterson captures this perfectly for us. He says that the church is an appointed gathering of named people in particular places who practice a life of resurrection in a world in which death gets the biggest headlines. Death of nations, death of civilization, death of marriage, death of careers, obituaries without end, death by war, death by murder, death by accident, death by starvation, death by electric chair, lethal injection, and hanging. The practice of resurrection is an intentional, deliberate decision to believe and participate in resurrection life, life out of death. Life that trumps death. Life that is the last word, Jesus life. This practice is not a vague wish upwards, but comprises a number of discreet but interlocking acts that maintain a credible and faithful way of life, real life, in a world preoccupied with death and the devil. Friends, it's clearly not enough for us to believe in the resurrection. We have to live out of the power of the resurrection that Jesus offers us. This is why Jesus was talking about his death and resurrection so much before it happened. Jesus is giving us the way of resurrection in a world consumed by and with death. In essence, anytime we take our eyes off the life that Jesus offers us, we turn towards death, away from what life God wants for us. And so today, before we get into our passage, the choice is simple for us. Are we going to hold on to that eraser and try to erase the line that Jesus is connecting for us on his death and resurrection to the way we live our lives? Or do we have the courage this morning to let go of it? To say, you know what? 
I don't need that. I want to hear what Jesus wants me to hear through these words. And we know that in this passage, this is the third time that Jesus is talking about his death and resurrection. Jerusalem is ahead of them. They are on their way. They will soon arrive. And once they arrive, the time will come. And this Jesus, this Messiah that they follow, will be taken from them. Jesus goes into a little bit more detail in his teaching this time around. He talks about how he's going to be flogged and spit upon. And whatever the disciples are thinking in this moment is obscured for us. We can't see what's in their minds. But if there is one thing we can know about them, it's this. Their heads are not in the game. They're thinking about something totally different. They are still stumbling over their expectations of what the Messiah is going to do. They don't know what awaits them, even them. So what is this that they're thinking about? In a word, glory. That's all they have a mind for. They can't stop thinking about it. Two brothers, James and John, they are obsessed with it. They want glory so bad that they dare to ask Jesus a question. But before they ask this question, they attempt to pat it with an assurance from Jesus. They say to Jesus, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Think of that for a moment. If your children said that to you, mom and dad, I want you to do for me whatever I ask you. Where is your mind going? No place good, no right? And there's asking this of God himself, Jesus. I mean, have you ever found yourself tempted to ask God such a thing? And strangely, Jesus does not push back. Like you would expect him to be like, okay, you're already off on the wrong foot here. But he doesn't go that way. He responds by saying, what do you want me to do for you? He asks them a question. And so they give him the request. They say, appoint us to sit next to you, one on your right and one on the left in your glory. Notice they don't say, well, James wants to be on the right and, and John on the, on the left. They're, they leave it vague, ambiguous. But they still want to be in seats of power. They want triumph. They want victory. They want these things. They want, in a word, glory. And Jesus' response is simply, he says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink from the cup that I will drink from? Can you be baptized with the baptism of what I'm going to be baptized with? In other words, are you willing to experience the death, suffering, and shame that awaits me? And oh, the hubris that often comes with vanity. They give a response with no shred of doubt. They say, we can. We are able There's no hint of doubt in that. Their certainty is a dangerous form of certainty. It's the form of certainty that occurs when we erase the line between the death and resurrection of Jesus and the way that we live our lives. Because when you're connected to that, the only response is humility. But they have no room for humility. They just want glory. So Jesus gives them a reality check. He says they're going to suffer and they are going to die. But it's not up to him to appoint those seats. But rather for those whom God has prepared it. So what began as a request for glory results in a conversation about the reality of death and resurrection. And you can imagine in this moment, the disciples, the other disciples, they're not happy. They're grumbling, Mark says. Now, I think the reason why they're not happy is not because John and James had the gall to ask Jesus this ridiculous question, but because they kind of wanted to do it themselves. And John and James beat him to it because they too are not tracing the line that Jesus is drawing for them. 
And so Jesus' response, he draws the line. He connects his teaching about the death and resurrection to the way they are to live their lives. He says, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. And then he says, not so among you. Those words ring out, not so among you. Jesus flips the table of their expectation. They want glory, triumph, victory, power, authority. They want to rule as the rulers do. They want to be great as the great ones are. We learned last week they wanted to be the greatest of the disciples because in their minds, they want to be like what the world thinks is great, what the world thinks is powerful. And all they can see is the, the hierarchy in the world, that the, there's those on top and then there's everybody down below. We learned last week that even the family household, it's called pater familias, you had the head of the household, the father, and then everybody below there. And in some cases, the, the head of the household could do whatever he wanted. He could sell his own children into slavery if he wanted to. He could put them to death if he wanted to because the household was meant to mirror the empire. And guess who's at the top of the empire? The emperor and the emperor can do whatever he wants in the empire. That's the world as they see it. And Jesus is like, that's not how it is with you. Because the way the world sees power and life necessitates power over others. But not so among you. Oh, church, I wish we could hear these words this morning. Real life does not come from having power over others, denying life to others, taking life from others, or snatching life from others. What is ever gained from such endeavors is certainly not life, not life in the sense that Jesus wants for us. Because real life, resurrection life, comes from the death and resurrection of Jesus. And when you're connected to that, you realize you can't build a life with the instruments of death. You can't find life with the compass of death. You can't secure life with credit from death. And you can't live life under the thumb of death. And friends, you cannot protect life with the weapons of death. Oh, church, I wish we could hear these words this morning when Jesus said, Seek first my kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. He was describing real life. And when Jesus told Peter to put away his sword, he was describing the life that we have in God cannot be snatched away by anyone. So put down the instruments of death. Because the only place you can find life is in Jesus Christ himself. And whatever you come up with on your own will never be enough. It will never be strong enough, deep enough, powerful enough, kind enough, wide enough. Are you hearing me this morning? Do I need to keep going? Okay. High enough, courageous enough, real enough, faithful enough, merciful enough, graceful enough, wise enough. Are you tracking? Patient enough, brave enough, peaceful enough, and loving enough. We will never have enough life without Jesus. Because there is more life in him. He is the one that brought life into being in the first place. And he is the one through his death and resurrection offers us abundant life. Life that no power or wealth could ever purchase or obtain. Friends, there is so much life in God that wants to be poured out into our lives. And thankfully, friends, our God is not stingy. See, when we come upon something good in life, we want to hoard it for ourselves, keep it to us. But thankfully, when it comes to life, God certainly does not do that for us. No, God is willing to give us that life so much that he'll pour out that life for us on the cross. Our God doesn't hoard our God is a God of promise and a God who provides. 
And how can this God do this? Well, Jesus is the only one who can claim to walk the streets of death and bring back what is rightfully his. Friends, we were dead to rights. We had no claim on life. We had no way out, but Jesus did. This is what he was trying to give us a little bit of when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is more life in me. There's more than enough for you. Oh, church, I wish we could hear these words this morning. But friends, to live this life, you not only receive it from Jesus, but you have to understand that if you settle for anything else, if you settle for any other arrangement, you're not going to find it there. In fact, you're going to erase the line of Jesus' connection with that life. That's why Jesus commands us, not so among you. He's telling us how to live this life. We don't have to live as those who lust for power, who thirst for control, who condemn others, who want to rule over others. We don't have to do that. And this is the earth truth of what Jesus is trying to tell the disciples. Here's the life. It's right here. It's offered to you. You don't need to seek this power. You don't need to do these things. It's right here. Jesus takes the cup of death so that we might drink of the cup of life. And yet we try to erase that line. And so friends, if we hear the words of Jesus this morning, not so among you, Those are life-giving words. But if we hear those words this morning, then we're going to find ourselves in an interesting position because when we receive those words, we realize that we're not meant to rule over, to glory over, or even to be served. But rather, we find ourselves in the interesting position of wanting to serve other people first. Because the truth is the life we find in Jesus will always lead you deeper into service. This is indeed the way we can tell if we aren't doing what we're supposed to be doing. If we become those who would rather be served than serve, then we can know we have lost our way. Why? Because Jesus tells us, not so among you. If we become those who believe others are not as important as us or have as much value as us, then we can know we have lost our way. Because why? Not so among you. And if we become those who actively deny life to others, snatch it from them in order to get a greater share for ourselves, then we know we have lost our way. Why? Because he says, not so among you. The life we find in Jesus will lead us deeper into service. And to do that, we have to die to all that which would steer us away from who Jesus is. And the truth we will discover when we get there is simply this, that there is more power for living here than anywhere else. And that's the basis for why we serve. So many people think we're meant to serve the poor or serve the weak because we feel guilty that their conditions are the way they are. No, we serve because we've received this great gift of life and we want others to be a part of that. Friends, the world will burn, destroy, conquer, pollute, and even kill in its pursuit of power. But it doesn't know that true power runs on love, not hate, peace, not war, faith, not fear, encouragement, not exploitation, and life, not death, certainly not that. Now, two weeks ago, we had a crazy week of storms, which is pretty standard for Ohio, right? Like, we go through these ebbs and flows, especially in February and March, And I don't know if we've ever had like a tornado warning in February before, Um, but we did, right? I was in Westchester at the time. People were frantically texting me like, 
you know, get, get underground. I'm like, I'm, I'm in Westchester. We don't have the tornado warning. It was bright and sunny. And Westchester was just the other side of the county. But the next day, it was also another day where it was just windy and bad weather. And I was traveling to Fairfield to take my daughter to her doctor's appointment. And as I was leaving the driveway, I noticed that gas was rather low. The light came on. I was like, well, I don't have enough gas to make it all the way to Fairfield. But luckily, I know that when you're driving on 27, there's a couple gas stations on the way. And so I get to the intersection of Stillwell Beckett and 27. You know where I'm talking about right now. And I always, I have this thing where I have to find the gas station that's on the right side of the road. Do you know what I'm talking about here? Like, I don't want to make a left turn onto 27. Like, I just want to pull in, get my gas, and pull right out. Like, I don't, I don't want no turning, stoplights, nothing. I just want it to be easy. So I know that the gas station in the corner there, the marathon, I think, uh, I could go get gas there, but then, you know, I'd have to go turn around, get out, make a left turn, all that stuff. So I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. And I, so I get there, but I'm going to check the price anyways, because you also have that standard to abide by, go with the cheapest gas. And I notice that the gas sign has no nothing on it. And there's nobody at the gas station. It looks completely abandoned. I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Good thing I'm not going to that gas station. So I turn and I drive down 27 a little bit and you know where the other gas station is in your mind. You've, you've driven on 27 before and it signs out too. Apparently this whole section of, of the road and that t area did not have power. It went out completely. And so now my like palms are starting to sweat. Like you know, I've got this van. I don't, I can't make it all the way to Fairfield. And then I remember, oh yeah, in Millville, there is a gas station and it's on the right side of the road. So I can get there, right? But then I'm also nervously thinking like, what if the power is out there? What am I going to do? Like, do I just stop? I don't even know if gas pumps work when you don't have power. I don't know these things. I've never tried it. And so I'm just fretting, obviously. And ultimately, as I was thinking about this this week, that's really, a, I think, where a lot of our um, desire for um, a, a life where we can get enough for ourselves comes from. It's not that we're, we're, we're out to destroy the lives of other people, but we have this sense that, you know what, the power might go out, and so I need more of this. I, I, I need to buy these things. I need to build up my wealth. I need to make sure my bank account is really big and all that stuff. I need all this stuff, and we, we, we live that. And we ignore these teachings that Jesus gave us about not storing up your treasure in earthen vessels where moth and rust can decay, but rather to store it up in heaven. See, that's really where that desire comes from. We're just afraid that at any moment the power's going to go out and we're not going to be able to make it. And what Jesus is trying to tell us this morning is you have no reason to fear. Because the life I offer, the power of life that I offer, will never go out. And once you are tapped into or plugged into this spiritual power grid, that life will run through you. And there is more than enough life in me to run through you. And that's possible because it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that we have been brought into this power of life. And once that power gets a hold of you, then I think you will truly understand what Jesus is saying to us when he says, not so among you. And you will see that no longer as a command, but rather as an invitation. An invitation to the life that God has given us through his death and resurrection. And once we receive that invitation, and I hope we do, but when we do it, don't be surprised, friends, if you find yourself serving other people as a result. Because once you experience that life, once you experience the abundant life, your desire to keep it for yourself goes away. And the first instinct you want to do is to share it with other people.
friends, that's how we know that the line that Jesus has drawn for us is really connecting with us. As when we live on behalf of others instead of them living on behalf of us. So friends, may we receive this invitation to real life today. That in a world consumed by death, we have found the bread of life. And he offers that bread freely to all. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we are thankful for your word and the way that you speak into our lives. Ultimately, Lord, we are thankful for what your son Jesus Christ did for us. That he walked into the territory of death and conquered it so that we might experience his life, real life. And this is a real life, Lord, that we don't have to wait for when we die. No, the whole point of your son coming back to us was to bring that life to us here and now. And that's why we can live the resurrection way of life. I pray, Lord, that we would practice resurrection mindfulness, but that we would live out of the greatest resource there is. And that is the life that you offer us through your resurrection. So, Lord, strengthen us in that confidence that we have more than enough with you, that your grace is more than enough, that your love is more than enough. And it's more than enough because of what your son has done for us. So, Lord, may we respond, not to a command, but to an invitation that we would live the way of the resurrection instead of the way of death. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. For our final hymn, we will be singing Because He Lives. You can find that on hymn number 364. We'll be singing the first and third verse. Benediction this morning. I want to remind our college students that we have lunch for you downstairs at the conclusion of the service, and also for the rest of us, we have fellowship time in the Memorial Lounge. But friends, as I was looking over our hymn this morning, I believe that the Gaithers, who wrote that hymn, Bill and Glow, 
They were not exaggerating when they said, because he lives, all fear is gone. It's tempting for us to think that's just hyperbole. Like, really, is all fear gone? Uh, we certainly experience fear all the time, don't we? When we turn on the news or whatever. But the truth that they know and they're trying to express is that as far as we are in Christ, all fear is gone. And every time we try to pull back, back into ourselves, we lose the confidence of faith. And faith reminds us that the life in Christ is more than enough. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because a future has been opened up for each one of us. So truly, all fear is gone. So friends, hear that good news this morning, that in Christ Jesus, we have peace and grace and life abundantly. Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in that life. Amen.